every country around the world has a form of human trafficking of some sort. Uh, flipping through the U.S. Department's annual trafficking in persons report, you can hear about the uh, young boys in African nations who are forced to work as fisher boys and have to go and untangle the nets and often drown when they're unable to, uh, to come up for air in time. There are the very well documented and very well known um, brothels that exist in Southeast Asia. That's where I first began working on this issue in 2000. Um, young boys and girls who are bought and sold by family members out of extreme poverty. There is the, uh, the forced uh, labor, the bricklayers in uh, China, which came out publicly. There are the rubber plantations, which have been exposed in various African <coughs> countries that have been traced back to some of the tires on the cars that we drive, modern day slave labor. We have been looking for all of these different types of uh, foreign, if you want to call them that, forms of trafficking for a very long time in Canada, looking for um, more uh, shiploads of containers, looking for the types of human trafficking um, that we've seen in the movies. And what we lost in the last 10 years, in my view, is looking for forms of exploitation and forms of trafficking that were very, very Canadian. And we didn't notice them because we had become so comfortable and used to them. And one of them in particular is something that you would have heard called pimping or child prostitution. The very first conviction, as some of you know, for human trafficking in Canada was of a man in the Brampton, Mississauga area who had recruited young Canadian girls in their teenage years, between 14 and 16. One of them was living in a group home and had fetal alcohol syndrome. He offered her a ride and a chance to get away. Yeah, she took it. And over a period of many, many months, he, through a forms of outright flattery and infatuation, built up a relationship and made her fall in love with him. When she decided she didn't want to sleep with men who were paying her boyfriend for money anymore, he threatened to kidnap her brother. He began abusing her. We wouldn't have called this human trafficking very long ago. We'd have said this is child prostitution and pimping. This problem has gone on for so long, no one would ever recognize it as that. But when we, t people around the world come to our country and they look at what we have going on here, they say, how is someone who is directly exploiting another, treating them as a commodity in your country through that form of exploitation any different from all of the other scenarios around the world where you have a third person who is controlling another for, for the purposes of, of exploiting them. That is exactly the same kind of uh, pattern we see internationally, but we ignored it for a long time. Things have only started to change really in the last uh, two to three years. It was only a crime to be trafficking in Canadians since November of 2005. That's it. It was, those were not crimes before. They were separate crimes. They would qualify as assault or prostitution. Crimes which on their own didn't reflect the true gravity of what's going on, which is the control and the exploitation over a very long period of time in a systematic human rights violation. That is very different and we're only starting to recognize it. The research that, uh, that our team at the University of British Columbia is doing is trying to account for the various forms of Canada's role in human trafficking. So it's similar to the types of uh, research that's being done in the parliamentary committees that are hearing evidence. Uh, we've been traveling across the country uh, interviewing people who've directly worked with, with victims. And you're starting to see in Canada moving beyond outrage into more focused action. It's not enough for us to be enraged or upset when we hear about human trafficking. We need to find our own particular piece that we can work on and make a difference in that way. So where I sit right now at a university is attempting to try to map this out and bring people together who are not currently sharing information with each other. It might surprise you to know that lead government agencies at the federal level who work on this issue as their day job until very recently were not keeping each other very well informed about how the progress was moving forward on this. It took an access to information request that we filed for the big fee of five dollars to find out how many victims of foreign trafficking had received the support of the Immigration Department. And those statistics which we released in the end of October at a conference held by the BC Office to Combat Trafficking confirmed that the problem of foreign trafficking, both labor and sex, sex exploitation related, is happening in Canada. We were able to not just talk about Asia and Europe, but get to the list of four top source countries for Canada. So it's, again, 
something like this couldn't have happened a year or two ago. So we're at a really pivotal uh, point in our history where we have finally got a criminal law in place, we finally have some protective services in place for foreign victims, and a BC uh, government office which is coordinating and preparing to coordinate services for others who may come forward, and a growing awareness of the problem. What we've seen in other countries that were got, got on this problem sooner, for example in the United States, who has actually been one of the things they have done globally, a world leader in dealing with the issue of human trafficking, they created their criminal offenses in 2000, they brought in victim protection around that time period. They have some issues, of course, as every country does. But what you see when you look at how they implemented it is a very few number of cases in the first year, both in terms of prosecutions and victim protection. But then they started to grow as awareness began to be built. Resources got implemented beyond simply the, the words on paper. And you see a steady increase of cases until they reach a fairly stable point, And you see consistent levels, more or less, of trafficking prosecutions. And a very sophisticated level of knowledge. We're beginning slowly to get to the point in Canada of not just talking about traffickers, but to the point of being able to name names, to know which organizations and, and street gangs are involved. And law enforcement has only begun to put the pieces together. So we're at a key point in time. One of the pieces of the research which I said I want to focus on now in the, in the uh, next 10 minutes or so is the issue of, of demand. This has not been on the table uh, as, a, as a part of this program to address human trafficking internationally until very recently. Most people were very happy to talk about the big bad traffickers. But they weren't as quick to admit that this problem only existed because of the demand in their own countries by Canadians, men and women, for both the cheap products, which we don't bother to ask questions about, or the men who are paying for sex in our cities today. Studies have shown that Canadian men who are purchasing sex do not care and cannot discriminate or know the difference between paying for sex with someone who may be an independent agent, someone who is under the control of another person, or someone who is fully forced. That's what the research is, is finding. Okay, so they don't know and they don't care. That girl I told you about who was uh, the 14-year-old girl with fetal alcohol syndrome, the first victim of human trafficking whose pro pro uh, prosecution of her trafficker succeeded, she was being sold on the internet on Craigslist. And when men showed up, they didn't see how young she was and turn away or ask about her very, very intimidating boyfriend who was there. They simply proceeded with what for them was a commercial transaction like buying a used lawnmower on the website. They just didn't care. So demand. It's an issue here in Canada, but it is also an issue here internationally. Canada has a law, as you've heard, to prosecute Canadians for traveling overseas and sexually exploiting or abusing children. The way that our law works, which has been in place since 1997, so almost 12 years now, is that it identifies a list of crimes, which are crimes in Canada, so sexual exploitation of a minor, for example, child prostitution, for example, and simply says they apply around the world. If you're a Canadian citizen, no matter where you are, if you commit these offenses against children, you can be held liable in a Canadian court. Now that was released with much fanfare. It was a big deal. It was a big commitment. We all came back from a conference in 1996 saying we were going to you know, join the rest of the world. The Stockholm Conference, the first World Congress against sexual exploitation of children. I just came back from the third World Congress against sexual exploitation of children in Brazil last month. And guess what? People remember that we made that commitment to prosecute our own nationals. NGOs know that Canadians are engaging in this behavior and abusing children. They are being required, and I'll be very frank here, to clean up the mess that Canadian offenders are making around the world. These are poor countries. We're forcing them to clean up the trauma and harm that Canadian men have visited upon very vulnerable boys and girls in these countries. The Cambodian head of, of ECPAT, uh, ECPAT Cambodia, which is a major international organization combating um, child sexual exploitation was, at, was beside himself when, when he talked to me, when he asked me, I, he said, I just don't get it. You, you, your country is viewed so favorably around the world. Everyone talks about how wonderful Canada is. How can you let these men, who are often convicted sex offenders, get a Canadian passport, travel to my country, abuse these children, often bribe their way out, and if there's any whiff of them being investigated, they go to the next country. How is it that we're supposed to bear the burden of that? 
And the answers that we have are not very good. The accidental prosecutions are the way that we have so far succeeded to get a small handful of Canadian men convicted under this law. Okay. This is very, very different from what other countries like Australia and the United States do, which is to place their liaison officers from a lead law enforcement agency in the field to actually contact local groups like ECPAT Cambodia and say, just so you know, our country has a law against this. If ever you have a case of someone who has come forward from your, one of the children you're helping, contact us. We will come and meet with you. We will take a statement from that child and we will see if we can lay a prosecution. Okay. Our approach is to do what, what's been, you know, create some posters. We've, you know, done that. That's, that's true. We have, uh, we have, it's a nice, it's a very nice poster, I have to say. I'm being very sarcastic because this is, it is a real sore spot for me that for, um, for such a long period of time, we have known that this was happening and we still have not taken any major steps. Imagine um, what more could be done if we proactively began enforcing our law. If we did that, we might see some statistics along the lines of what the Americans and the Australians are doing. Uh, between 2003 and 2008, the U.S. Customs and Immigration uh, Enforcement Agency, ICE, made 67 arrests and secured 47 uh, convictions in that five-year period. We had one. Okay. In Australia, between 1995 and 2007, the Australian Federal Police, who have officers stationed in child sex tourism hotspots, conducted 158 investigations. That resulted in 28 charges and 19 convictions. We have a lot more to do. The world has noticed. Um, we were hiding behind our very good words for a long time, but we have been found out. Um, I have to tell you. It's, it worked for a while, um, but we've been found out. So this is what the latest U.S. State Department report did. It criticized Canada for not prosecuting or investigating allegations of child sex crimes against its nationals. It called on us to increase our efforts to investigate and prosecute Canadians suspected of committing child sex tourism crimes abroad. The money Canadian men are paying in developing countries, and it's a short list, we know which these countries are, is fueling human trafficking. It creates a demand, a disproportionate demand. Local men are paying in local currency. Cambodian men are paying to abuse these children as well, absolutely. But when a Canadian man goes over there with hard currency, often American dollars, and is paying significantly more to insist for younger girls because they're worried about STDs and want to have unprotected sex with these young children, that drives demand. Without that huge influx of Canadian bread money, um, we and our American friends and our European friends would not be making such a big contribution to this problem. The last point I wanted to, uh, to, to, to illustrate for you was what the outcome of this Rio conference was. Um, this is a, available on, the, on my website if anyone is interested off the UBC Law Faculty. It's actually open for uh, consultation and comments until the end of the month. That's a great opportunity if any of you um, want to give feedback on this draft document. It's one where I would be happy to forward that to the conference organizers. So please uh, take a look at this. It deals with th uh, four main issues in particular because the conference is related to children. Child prostitution, child pornography, child trafficking, and child sex tourism. And of course, they're highly interrelated. What the um, Rio Pact draft has in it are some important provisions that I was involved in helping to get into this final document with a number of NGOs. The first is, not surprisingly, calling on countries to designate a lead law enforcement agency to proactively enforce extraterritorial laws related to the sexual exploitation of children and adolescents. 1996 commitments were to create those laws. It's taken us until 2008 to say maybe someone should go about enforcing them. In Canada, this should obviously be the RCMP. The RCMP has liaison officers around the world, including in major child sex tourism hotspots. They work on uh, drug cases, Canadian um, document identity fraud, all sorts of serious transnational crimes. This needs to be on their mandate to be enforced on a proactive basis. The National uh, Child Exploitation Coordination Center, the NCECC, is the RCMP division that so far has been processing and receiving these tips as they happen to come into them. Organizations in the field are sending the, these tips to people like myself because they don't know who else to send them to. We're not talking about, we think it was a Canadian. 
The kind of evidence that I have personally received in Florida, the RCMP in the last five years have included photocopies and scanned versions of the passports of these men. How did they get that? Most of these hotels require passports to be provided and they're very happy to hand them over when they find out what these men have been doing to kids in their hotel establishments. Don't assume that everyone is in on this deal. A lot of corruption happens, but many people are outraged at it. Victim witness statements are also forthcoming. In many cases, computer files have been obtained through local police, and there's all sorts of evidence, which is enough to show me that we need to have Canadian officers involved in gathering evidence because we can't simply rely on this sort of material to result in convictions. The second and more important aspect um, that we could immediately do, which the Rio Pact calls for, is a very important step that Interpol has taken. Interpol has been doing more to deal with this issue than Canada in many ways. Some of you know Christopher Paul Neal. This was the man last year who had the swirled photo, um, also from the Vancouver area, Maple Ridge. He was recently convicted of his second count and sentenced to six years in a Thai prison. Interpol was involved heavily in finding him. They have a special program through Interpol for serious violent criminals. It's called the Green Notice System. The way that it works is if someone who is, for example, a convicted murderer wants to travel abroad, our national representative for Interpol is able to send out this green notice to the country where that person is going to travel to let them know this person has been convicted. We're not talking allegations, we're talking convictions in a Canadian court of law. Then it leaves it to this foreign country to decide if they want to admit that person or say, you know, you're not welcome here. We don't want you here. Only recently did Interpol amend their green notice system to allow for convicted child sex offenders to clearly be included in this. So the Rio Pact calls on countries to establish this international travel notification system where individuals with a history of engaging in sexual exploitation of children would have to notify of their travel before leaving with a, in accordance with applicable laws and then the state where they're purporting to travel to would get to decide how to deal with that. So the world has noticed that we have not been doing our part to address the very clear contribution we are directly making. Uh, at a bare minimum, we need to at least not be the ones contributing to the problem. If, if all Canada was doing was sitting here and minding our own business, that would be one thing. I would still have a problem, and I think most people in the room would think we should, we should still have a moral obligation to do something about it. But we actually are doing more harm than good on the child sex tourism issue today. That is something I can say with a very high degree of, of confidence, and it needs to change. I saw Canadian men my own age when I was first in Cambodia wearing backpacks with Canadian maple leaves on them, walking through Spy Pak, which is one of the very well-known child brothel districts just outside of Phnom Penh. And it was one of the most shameful things that I have ever seen in my entire life because that's the flag that we have told the world should be assigned to welcome us. And when you go somewhere with the Canadian flag, you get greeted and people usually find something nice to say to you. That's why so many Americans wear them on their backpacks. <laughs> it's true. They do. It is true. Yeah. So cer certainly we can do more to deal with this issue. Um, if, there are, if there are any organizations uh, here today who are um, working with individuals who are perhaps this talk of human trafficking made you think that these individuals may be exploited by someone else. Um, I would love to talk to you. That's how we do our research. It's not from sitting in an office up there in the woods. It feels very sophisticated to come downtown after having an office in the woods, I have to tell you. Um, but it's by getting on the ground, by directly meeting with the Aboriginal groups that you've heard about, going to their shelters, meeting some of these young women, and the desire to do the same thing here in Vancouver. So please do reach out and um, thank you so much for, for making it part of your time to um, become educated and informed more than you are before you came here. And I hope something that I've said will, uh, will trigger something, some sort of action in you. Uh, because certainly th this group on the panel, um, you know, we are all getting very, very old. Um, I am growing a lot of gray hair working on this project and I am still a very young man. So uh, we need your help too. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you to the uh, BC Coalition. <laughs>